but now is the kind of main event where we're going to have a panel and we're going to bring up an esteemed panel of guests to come and join me. So please give a big hand of uh, applause to our panelists who are going to talk about the landscape of travel in 2030. And we have Mr. Fahd uh, Hamadadin, the CEO and a member of the board of Saudi Tourism Authority. We have Julia Simpson, the pre president and CEO of the World Travel and Tourist uh, Council. We have Peter Kruger, Kruger, a member of the executive board and the director, uh, the chief strategy officer of TUI. And we have Simon Calder, a very well-known and highly respected travel journalist and broadcaster. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of people at the back who haven't got seats. If you've got a seat next to you that's free, can you just put your hands up to make it easier for them to come and find the seats? Thank you. OK, well, thank you all for joining us on the panel. And uh, I don't know if you've got a chance to catch any of that, but hopefully it's given you a, a little bit of food for thought to start the conversation. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask a few questions of the panel just to get everyone in the room, same sort of place, understand their thinking. And then we're going to open the floor out to you to ask some questions. So what I'm going to ask you to do, uh, start with the panel, is just to take no more than two minutes, and we all have a clock in front of us as our guide. The clock is our, is our controller. Just take two minutes each to firstly outline your vision of what travel in 2030 and beyond could look like. So, Mr. Hamadadeen, would you like to start us off on that? Um, I'm very delighted to be joining you. Thank you, Rohit. And um, I'd like to maybe build on what you said earlier today. You talked about the layers of uncertainty that are concerning travelers. So if we think of travelers first, let's ask ourselves, what is it that they want? It's not our vision. Our vision should deliver against their aspiration of what travel could look like. So I would say they want trust first, building on the layers of uncertainty. So I won't repeat what you said. You were on point, and I think trust is, is definitely number one. Then power. I think with what technology avails today for us, we can definitely fulfill that aspiration of travelers. I think they need to know, they need control and power over what they do, how they do it, when, and if things go wrong, what happens. The third aspiration, I would say, is um, they want ease. I mean, allow me to, to just exemplify. In Saudi, we just started, really. But our first, first digital offering was our e-visa portal. And I'm delighted to say it's the fastest in the world. But it's, that's just the beginning. And I think during the pandemic, Mother Nature gave us time to learn what we need to do together. And while all ecosystem players, from governments, airports, airlines, hotels, all aligned around controls and measures and PCR requirements to save lives, we need to learn from that. If we can all group to save lives, let's remain grouped to have a frictionless experience. So if, if we take what you've just said, and just, let's just take a few seconds then to step to 2030. Those are all really critical building blocks. What's your vision of, of what travel in 2030 for, in Saudi could look like if we're responding to those things? And what, what, what are the key pillars of your vision for the future? Um, as I said, I think it's offering what they want. It's a trust, power, ease, and finally, privilege. Okay. And I think privilege, every traveler wants to feel special and special and get what lu modern luxury is. Luxury is no longer gold and bling bling. It's uh, luxury today is sustainability. Very uh, nicely talked about, very poorly acted upon. So if we want to do good for tourism, we need to deliver and invest and commit to what sustainability takes from uh, cultural authenticity to natural preservation to regenerative tourism where relevant. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, if you want to pick up the baton, coming from a Chewy perspective, what's your vision of what travel in 2030 and beyond could look like? Yeah. 
<clears throat> so as you know, Rohit, our company is working in tourism. So when I talk about travel, I really mean tourism. We are a strong believer of connecting distribution and product. And what we see, in particular in newer destinations, there's a huge lack of product. So that's why the product development towards customer needs is very important. And we see actually three main drivers uh, going forward. So the first one is experiences. We tend to say experiences is new luxury. Sustainability is also a luxury and important, and I'll come to it as well. But first of all, it's experiences. People want to experience something. People don't want to go somewhere and just lay on the beach for two weeks. Um, this is what people used to do. In the future, people want to go out, see the country experience, and really um, connect with the local people and, and have a unique experience. Now, people will have more money available. We're in a growing, um, in, a, in a very prosperous society. I'm not talking about the UK exclusively, but from a global pattern, you have upcoming middle classes, so there's more money available. People have more time to spend, they retire earlier, they want to see more things. So the mega trends on the demand side are very strong. And then what we see as a second key driver is really individualized offerings. So people don't want to have a mass-produced product. People want to have a personal experience, so this is very important. And technology will be a, a huge enabler uh, to get there. And people want to have something unique, something very exclusive. So this is something we need to reflect on the product side as well when we shape our products. And then, of course, sustainability. Um, and this comes in, in many forms. I mean, we always say tourism um, is a force for good because the value transfer from a macroeconomic perspective in terms of wealth, from wealthy countries to destinations that are upcoming is huge. It's a huge economic factor for, for destinations. And I'm sure we will talk about it later. With, um, there's also one very interesting example that we always quote uh, that where you can actually see what we mean. So this is a little island in the Caribbean. It's divided between two countries. One is Domrep and the other one is Haiti. If you go to Domrep, tourism is big. You have jobs, you have schools, education is a lot higher compared to Haiti. Haiti was closed for tourism. It's the same island, so it had nothing to do with the destination. It's really that openness for, for tourism um, as a force for good as well. Thank you. So Simon, if you could pick up, we've talked quite a lot about the customer in different respects. What's your, your view about what's going to be important to the customer in 2030 and beyond? Well, very luckily, and good morning everybody, lovely to see you, I'm already at World Travel Market 2030, and it's the 50th anniversary, and everyone's in a very good mood, because during the 20s, it's become clear that people are doing more travel to more places and enriching themselves far better than ever before. And we will be looking back on the beginning of the 2020s and thinking, my goodness, that was the time when we fully appreciated just how important a, uh, uh, it is to travel in the way that we, uh, uh, we want to have experiences which are uh, going to deliver so much more than possessions. And that, I think, is the big, big change that we will have seen by 2030. Who cares about a new car when you can go and discover new destinations? Yes, we will be going to the traditional destinations and enjoying ourselves more. Yes, we will, as uh, Peter says, be uh, wanting more experiences. But we will also appreciate the value that travel brings to the world as well as to ourselves and we will be looking at value in travel across a whole range including issues like we will we will be particularly uh, uh, keen on uh, spending money with places that are interested in sustainability that are tackling over tourism and diverting people that whose human rights records we respect those are all going to become really important. But the great news is that we have seen that travel is desperately important to people. They want to build those memories. They want to have those enriching experiences. And I think um, from pretty much all points of view, it's going to be great uh, in the 2030s and beyond. Thank you. Julia, so we've heard about the customer, heard a little bit about destination. We've heard a lot about experience. Uh, I want you to put your economist hat on now. Tell us a little bit, you've done a lot of research about travel in 2030 and beyond. Can you give us some of the headlines, the economic headlines coming out of that? Absolutely, Rohit. So they do the exciting bit and I do the numbers, but never mind. Um, yeah, no, 
Good morning, everybody. Isn't it fantastic to see World Travel Market come back to life? I mean, it's, we were here last year, some of us were, and there were people here, but it's great. And I loved, Rohit, your um, uh, presentation. It was really fascinating, and I'm going to have to, you know, develop my moves on the dance floor. But just looking at numbers now, travel and tourism globally, and I represent the voice of the private sector, 200 of the top CEOs, for nine consecutive years before COVID, it was a growth economy. It was, it was, it was grow, growth sector. It was growing faster than the general global GDP. And we've done some analysis with Oxford Economics, who many of you may work with. They're an offshoot of Oxford University. And by, in 10 years' time, over those, that period, we're expecting travel and tourism to grow again by almost double the rate of global GDP. So there is a real, real desire to travel. And while I'm sure there is a generation of 11 and 14-year-olds that you know, want to experience the world uh, behind a computer, I do actually believe that those people, when they grow up, will want to grow up or get older, will want to experience the world physically. Um, you're also seeing the world opening up. It's lovely having Fahad here today because I've been to Saudi Arabia several times. And when you look at, the, at that project, you know, Neon project, which is the size of Brussels, you know, a completely not, not a net zero project, but a net positive project. I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia has just won the um, Olymp Winter Olympics. I mean, who would have thought that? So there are whole areas of the world that are opening up and offering very, very new and different experiences. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is people are really, really worried about the economy. And what we've been seeing in travel and tourism is demand currently has been outstripping supply. Um, I think the supply hasn't been there for various factors. Some of the people leaving our sector, some of the demographics. But you've definitely had, it's not just pent up demand, it's pent up savings. And people have asked me, when is that going to end? Is this a bubble? Some of the latest data we've seen from the US is some of those savers have actually worked through, you know, some of their savings. Um, but actually that pent up demand and travel now, where do people want to go? They wanted the wilderness, then they wanted outdoor travel. And now people really want to get back to cities which is interesting. Thank you, and we'll come back on some of that. So now let's move on and go a little deeper. You've all picked up the theme of sustainability. I touched on climate change. Um, Fad, you have uh, this incredible uh, vision for 2030. Can I ask you to put your climate change and sustainability hat and talk to us about how you're factoring those into your vision? I think... Um Starting with the global tourism, I think um, Saudi is committed to contributing to the net zero contribution of this sector by 2050. So that's a commitment at a global level. We owe it to the sector. And as Julia said, this sector has outperformed other sectors and the growth is expected to be 3x by 2030 if we continue going at this rate. So I think the sector cannot afford to fail what happened in the pandemic, something we cannot repeat. But we have to also, with that growth, net zero by 2050 is a commitment for all. I think the second is um, contribution at a thinking level and um, thought leadership, creating a, a true north for what sustainability is. Because to be very frank, a lot of people talk about sustainability, very few act upon it. It comes at a cost and a very high ticket price. So we are launching the Global uh, Tourism Sustainability Center with global members at the board just to make sure that what we do contributes to the world in terms of building a case. And then as, at Saudi level, I think sustainability is, uh, starts from the people before it goes to nature. And uh, being true to the locals, then to, to nature. So we are safeguarding 70% of our land to reserves. We're rewilding 21 species. We started with the Arabian leopard just last August. Three days ago, we announced the second species, the, the cheetahs. We're rewilding. But also, as we develop the Red Sea, which has coral reefs and marine treasures that are second to none, 
we need to make sure that we do this and preserve. Now, again, again, great talk, but the good thing is soon you will put this talk to the test and see if we're developing these destinations to what, we, uh, to what sustainability is asking us. Thank you. Um, Peter, something we haven't touched on at all yet is you, you touched a little bit on personalization, but take us a little deeper into what role you see technology playing in enabling what you talked about, but also what all of us have talked about. Sure. So, Rod, I'll answer your question, but if you allow, just on sustainability, because sure. I think it's um, very important for Tui as well. So, as strategists, we apply a very simple concept. It's called SWOT analysis, all of you know, right? Now, the question is, we ask ourselves, is sustainability a threat or an opportunity? And actually, we see it as an opportunity, right? So in TUI, you can see we're investing a lot now in sustainable uh, resources. Um, actually, the interesting thing is, it's not necessarily a cost. It's an investment. And the return on the investment is huge. For example, if we look at our hotels in the Maldives, if we put up solar panels, um, it's a little uh, a contribution to the hotel. But what you can see is, on the whole island, there's diesel production. The business case for solar calculates after three years, you get your investment back. So the business cases in sustainability are super, super attractive, and that's why we see it more as an opportunity than a threat. Now, technology, um, of course, is an important driver as well. Um, I liked um, the, the overview you gave us earlier, which is a little bit more long-term vision, and of course, in TUI, we also uh, have a project team looking into virtual reality. I mean, one of our uh, hotels uh, in Madrid, the Rio Hotel, has a very nice rooftop space. We have already a virtual reality access to this rooftop space, so we're experimenting a little bit. But of course, um, there is, uh, let's say, a very provocative thesis in, tu in TUI where we're discussing can we not sell our hotel rooms twice? So we sell it to our customers, of course, and then we sell it again in a more virtual reality world. But this is something, of course, which, which, which will take a little bit more time. now more short-term, technology will be an enabler for more connected trips, so seamless travel, as uh, Fahad was saying. I was um, in Riyadh uh, two weeks ago, I must say, I mean, the, the traveling to, to Saudi Arabia is incredible, easy, very smooth, um, great job done. Um, but of course, it will enable on two ends. One is making, on the distribution side, making the product offerings available. So. We come from traditional packaging, which means you package a flight and a hotel. It's a simple combination of two, one hotel, one flight, or two flights if you take the two legs. And then the other uh, question, of course, is um, with our products that we have available in the group now, we can, with our technology today, offer to you six billion combinations of the different travel products we have. So it's an enabler on the booking distribution side. It's also important for service and information, and this goes to the connected trip, more seamless travel for customers. Excellent, thank you. So Simon, we, um, we've had the destination perspective, we've had the uh, environmental perspective, we've had the tour operator perspective, and we've had the economic perspective, and we've all talked about customer. We haven't talked much about airlines yet, and aircraft. So we know that the 737 has been around, what, 54 years in commercial operation, uh, the Airbus A320s for about 33 years. They're handling the bulk of short haul and quite a lot of long haul. Uh, what's it going to look like in 2030? Where do, where do you think we're going well, in aviation? Well, I, I can reveal exclusively that you might be going to Madrid to check into uh, the fantastic Rio Hotel there. And I'm, I'm boggled by the idea that Peter's already going to be in his hotel and I'm going to be there virtually. Sounds very um, unusual, but uh, there we are. But you will be travelling there, of course, on an Airbus A320 series aircraft or a Boeing 737 series aircraft, because basically they work. And yes, they have been around for over half a century in the term, case of the 737, but um, they've clearly been getting uh, much, much more efficient, and that will carry on. By 20, 20, 2030, remember I'm there already, we are seeing some electric aircraft already flying around. They will tend to be covering uh, the areas like the Maldives, Orkney in Scotland, um, the uh, Pacific Northwest, areas where you've got short flights um, uh, using 
small aircraft with a limited number of people. You might move into hybrids. I think hydrogen power is more likely. And um, we're not going to be there at any scale by 2030, but uh, things will have improved. Don't forget, we had a massive sustainability improvement uh, during COVID when all those um, gas guzzling 747s were flown off to uh, Victorville in Southern California um, to, uh, to, to, to uh, live out their, their days. Um, we've moved to, to a world in which um, the aircraft that we are now flying long distances is a much, uh, much more efficient. And frankly, the passenger experience has not changed one bit in the uh, 52 years since the jumbo jet was uh, uh, launched. And I don't suppose it will change much more, particularly if we're doing the right thing sustainably, which is sitting down the back in economy by the loo, um, because that will have the lo lowest impact. One thing which will happen, I, I, I uh, predict by 2030, is that your baggage will already be in your hotel room. And Peter will be looking after it in Madrid because we will get used to the idea that it gets picked up from our homes, from our offices, and delivered actually to the room. We will pay a premium for that, but it's a heck of a lot uh, better than your, your luggage ending up in a different continent to the one you're in. <laughs> Thank you. Julia, we, we've all talked a lot about sustainability and climate change. We have a bunch of world leaders in Sharm El Sheikh, hopefully, putting action behind the words that they're, they're coming out of their mouths. What, what's WTTC doing to encourage the industry to really move as fast as it can on sustainability and climate change? Oh, Rohit, we've got three major projects. And the first thing I wanted to say to the room, it's really important on sustainability, which I agree is an opportunity, by the way. Mm. And also, there is now a lot of money. If you look at the Investment Act in the US, there is people are investing it. So it is a me inv investors investing in sustainability. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, but one thing I think we need as a sector is to really narrate a single narrative around sustainability. You know, I have sadly sometimes heard hoteliers saying, I'm okay on sustainability, the problem of the airlines. And that just actually won't do. It's also wrong. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, I had a background in aviation. And I do agree, electric planes, drones, hydrogen. But what will get us through to 2030 is sustainable aviation fuel. And we need 3,000 of these depots around the place and investment. But the actual technology is there, and the technology will take our household waste and it will turn it into what I call go liquid gold, which is jet fuel. Um, and it is a very, very refined substance. That's why it's quite hard to replicate, because we don't want it freezing at 30,000 feet. But I think in our sector, it's really important that we tell everybody else's story. So, you know, on aviation, you've got SAFs, SAF, or green fuels. Um, you've also got, and it, it all sounds a bit boring, but at the United Nations, a branch of the United Nations that looks after aviation is uh, ICAO. And ICAO have just come, it's a set of countries, it's not, it's not the private sector. And they've just come to an agreement on a major offsetting scheme. And this offsetting scheme globally will allow certain areas of aviation that cannot meet their targets in time to be able to offset within the cap of different countries. It's called Corsia, but it is actually critical. I do love hydrogen, but remember, hydrogen in its liquid form at the moment takes up four, much, four times the amount of space of jet fuel. So it's not going to be our solution for 2030. And how you deliver it to airports also might be fine at JFK, but not so much so easy at Nairobi. So we need to think of those things. But what we want to help on is three things. First of all, the WTTC has created um, a net zero roadmap to 2050. And we've got all the individual sectors, crews, airlines, tour operators, everybody in one area. Up. Oh, speak up a bit. No, speed up. Speed up, oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> so we've got, we've got that, and please look at it because that will help you tell your story. We're also gonna introduce at the beginning something called Hotel Sustainability Basics. 
The big hotel groups know what they're doing on sustainability, but 80% is made up of SMEs. They're small mum and dad B&Bs, as we used to call them, and they need to understand how they, can they get their first set on the, step on the ladder of a sustainable journey, maybe traveling through to someone like Travelist. So it's just 12 things you need to do, very simple. And finally, we're all talking about today's COP, but at the end of the year, there's a COP15, which is about nature and biodiversity. And we are the guardians of biodiversity in our, in our, our sector. We are existentially linked to it. And we are, as Farhad said, replanting, bringing species back and protecting species. So we have developed for us in this room a, um, a positive nature roadmap. Please download it from the WTTC website. It will be really useful to you. Thank you, Julia. That was a great five-minute, two-minute speech. Right. <laughs> um, let's, let's go back around the panel now. And you've actually answered some of the, the next question I was going to ask you. So um, let's go to Simon. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk about uh, other modes of transport, uh, Hyperloop, <laughs> space tourism, Again, you're in 2030. Tell us what's going on with those. What, how might they be evolving out that, at that sort of time frame? OK, so Hyperloop, which, as you all know, is basically a big vacuum tube. So it looks like the London Underground, but effectively it's a vacuum. And you've got a magnetically levitated train whizzing through there at 760 miles an hour. Um, that's on Hyperloop, not the tube. Um, that is, uh, well, it looks as though it's um, toast, I'm afraid. It did seem to be the fantastic solution, but Elon Musk three days ago said that he was abandoning his project, um, and uh, Sir Richard Branson has also uh, said that he's debranding Virgin from that Hyperloop possibility. Might have some small future in some cargo uh, issues, but I don't think that is going to be happening. Of course, we all, in a perfect world, um, with respect to the airlines, uh, we want to be travelling by rail. And fortunately, by 2030, we finally reached the stage in Europe where actually it's pretty much as straightforward, partly because of the fantastic technology that uh, Peter has developed, um, to, to book a journey from, let's say, the UK to Spain by rail as it is by air. That is still a huge, huge problem. And. Um, it, 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 modes of transport, I think, will be increasingly under the microscope in terms of their impact. But actually, we will also realise that if you've got an electric car and you've got four people in it and you're driving 500 miles, that's actually a pretty low impact way to travel. We'll also see, um, I think, long distance coaches, which are electric powered, coming in. So it will be a future which I think is, is um, full of uh, just, just cleaner, greener, better transport won't necessarily be any more comfortable but um hey it's the experience where you get to your destination excellent thank you peter earlier on you touched on a few aspects of the way technology could impact but take us through that end-to-end -end journey from having the inspiration to travel through booking through travel to being at your destination how do you see the technology being weaved in to create that truly personalized experience yeah sure so, so as I said before, technology, we see it predominantly as an enabler. Of course, we have to also you know, keep uh, our eyes on technology as a potential disruptor, right? That's very important as well, because in, in strategy, most of the time, the disruptive part is underestimated. Anyway, now, in terms of technology, as I said, for booking, it's really giving the power and choice back to the customers, right? I mean, before the internet, 30 years ago, you wanted to go to Panama. You were looking for a hotel. You had two choices. One was the Hilton Hotel. The, next, the, the hotel next door had no name. So you didn't really know what is this hotel offering about. Will you come back alive? Is the food good? Is the hotel actually there or not? Today, you go on TripAdvisor, you go on Google, you review, you have 20,000 review of the hotel, customer experience, so you have access to data information. So this information part and in giving back the choice to customers to choose their own packages in the future is very important. And package doesn't stop at flight at, at hotels. We have uh, recently acquired a company called Museman, where we do a lot of in-destination experiences, tours, activities, concert tickets, whatever you like as an experience, will become part of a package going forward. So enabling this choice and the vast 
product offering you have. This is technology. Number two, of course, when you come to the destination, you want to have service, right? So your flight is delayed, you wonder about your transfer, is it there or not? So technology can, of course, help to keep you informed, to, to be a, a service element, um, and also to have that experience of a really connected, seamless travel. So technology will big, uh, play a big role there. What we see in TUI today, because we already do it, people still would like to have some sort of human touch as well. So our strategy is actually not digital core, but digital plus. So technology will support, but of course, we still have 20,000 people on the ground supporting our travelers for questions and so on. Over time, it may change, but we believe it will never become pure technology only. Um, and then, of course, a lot of other companies are talking about the connected trip um, as, as the next uh, big thing in travel. We also think it's, it's the future. We have already started um, to offer a lot of these connected trip features to our customers. So it's really choice back to customers on booking, and then it's really service information, and maybe, and that's also going forward more relevant, sharing the experiences with your friends. So this entire network experience that you have uh, when you come back from a great holiday, I mean, people taking 50 pictures on the same spot just to make the one perfect picture, and then you post it on Instagram, and, and this is also part of the future, of course, and then people like the picture, want to also have that picture, and then they come back and go to these unique um, destinations. Thank you. Fahad, we, we've um, heard a lot of great ideas. You talked a lot about some of the um, incredible ambitions you have. We know this takes a lot of investment. And we know that Saudi is probably the biggest investor in tourism right now. Um, what would you say are, are some of the critical areas of investment for you in reaching that ambition that you have for 2030 and beyond? What are the big pillars that you're focusing on? I think, um, if I may just allude to some of the points, there were so many great points. I want to start with... have you all come back on that, but... Okay, uh, I just want to say what WTTC is, is offering the private sector is, is unparalleled. No one else provides what the private sector needs, a voice at the heads of state table in decision making. And we saw that, we experienced it in Saudi when we worked with the WTC, and that's where our commitment to Julia is to continue uh, you know, supporting her, um, uh, their mission to support the private sector being heard and being in the decision-making room. I think the sustainability being an opportunity, I cannot agree more, and it will be rewarded by the most rewarding travelers. I also would like to say that the future, when we talk about 2030, I think, and Saudi Arabia is trying to do that, and you asked me the pillars, I think there is polarizing poles, one taking us into back to our roots, remain to what is authentic, preserving our heritage and UNESCO site and so on. And we just launched with the UNWTO a fund and a commitment of 100 million, not just in Saudi, but globally to preserve the best tourism villages. But at the, on the other side is going to the other extreme. I, I'm, I mean, I didn't know about Peter's uh, and Tui's thesis about metaverse, but we're investing heavily. Again, this is another buzzword that everybody's talking about. What, real, what, what is it really? It's something that we will unfold as we experiment and test. But Saudi is definitely uh, investing big in that space because while you can book second room, it's endless offering of a whole new world. You can transact, you can play, you can share, not just on your social account, but through your avatars on all your uh, alias identities that you, you have uh, in that space. And we started seeing it in the events industry. Saudi Arabia today is investing in the largest, the largest number of events from business conferences and exhibitions down to electric music. Our Middle Beast, the EDM um, event, hosted the largest number of youth in, I mean, who would assume Saudi will host the, you know, uh, as Julia said, the Winter Olympics in 2029, uh, uh, but also that the Middle Beast, which is the EDM concert, will actually host 600,000, more than all the EDM, um, um, uh, you know, events. So we've started seeing how metaverse is changing the economics 
of the events industry, seeing gaming, music, merging and creating that multiplier. If you can see that and people travel for it, how can businesses and governments realize the new alternative economy that will come with it? Excellent, thank you. And just for those of you in the room who aren't quite as hip as Fahad and myself, EDM stands for electronic dance music. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got a few minutes left. I think we've got some microphones in the room. I can't see you, but I believe there are some mic people. Yep. Uh, great. I see some people waving. Has anyone here got a question you'd like to put to the panel? Uh, yeah, the lady down at the front. Can we get someone racing down here with a mic? Can you, um, two things. One, can you introduce yourself, say who you are and where you're from? And then can you make sure it's a question and keep it short? Okay, my name is Anne Bigging. I'm the founder of Healing Hotels of the World. And my only question is, what about health tourism? Thank you. Let's I'm, take one of you. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to pick that up because I think uh, wellness in, in Anne, it's lovely to see you here. I think wellness is not only a fantastic thing to do, but it's a big growth market. You know, they're saying that uh, when, when industries in our sector are offering wellness, they can actually increase some of their profits by 50% because of all the adjunctual things. And I think wellness is also kind of a spiritual thing because the work that's happening in Mecca or Mecca and also in, in Bethlehem, Bethany um, in Jordan, you know, there's a, these, you know, you, the, the, the walk to Comp, uh, Compostela, Santiago de Compostela. So I think it is becoming, I'm sure Simon will have a view on this, but it is becoming more the norm. It used to be something unusual and sort of slightly on the side, and it is now wellness is absolutely central to everything we're doing. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I, yes, all gonna, I would add. Well, to, I'm going to take only one answer per question to get several in. Gentlemen here. If you've got questions at the back, it's hard to see you, so can you stand up and we'll make sure we get the mics to you. So if you stand up now, if you've got a question, and then we'll get the mics to you. Again. Hi, Billy. Oh. <clears throat> Billy Colbert from Hospitable Me. This year we've seen a lot of focus on historically excluded and marginalized communities in travel, and I haven't heard much talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in your visions of the future. Where does it fit in? Who'd like to talk uh, about I'm very happy to tackle that. Yeah, if you go back to 1980, and no, I wasn't here, but the uh, very first world travel market was um, opened by Miss World. Yes, Kimberly Santos from Guam. And um, I very much hope that in 2030, there will be an individual from a, uh, a, a marginalized group who will be doing fantastic things in the travel world. I think the opportunities for travel, not just, of course, to enrich the individual traveler, but to open up the world and open up opportunities for people in those communities is immense. I've just been to the Northern Territory of Australia, where are, there are fantastic things happening with the uh, traditional Aboriginal custodians of the land getting properly involved in, in tourism. And uh, I, absolutely, it's a trend that we, uh, we, we need to encourage. And uh, some really good, enlightened parts of the travel industry are doing just that. Okay, there's a gentleman down here. As I say, if, if you're at the back of the room and you've got a question, can you stand up so we can see you? Because I don't want to just yeah. over the people at the front. There's a lady standing. The uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Jonah uh, from uh, Madagascar. And uh, my quick question for you, after uh, the beautiful presentation, what do you suggest for a destination like Madagascar after the crisis, it return to 20 or 30 years back instead of to go to the future? So would you have suggestions about such Peter, destination? Peter, would you like to say this one? I think, um, I mean, I need to speak to you later because Madagascar is a very interesting destination. So what I think what is important if you want to build a real tourism presence in a new destination, what a lot of the new destinations are lacking is not demand. They're lacking product. Product that fits to the demand, right? Now in TUI, we have 21 million customers and products, so we know exactly how to shape what product we need to sell it to our customers, right? So therefore, I think um, my recommendation uh, to Madagascar would be invest into products, the demand will come. I mean, my wife and, and myself, we've been to Basaruto lately, coming quite close now uh, to Madagascar. Amazing product offering, Indian Ocean, one of the best beaches you can get. 
So it, it's all there. All we need is to have the relevant product. So let's catch up after the session. Uh, there's a lady at the back there, I think, stood up. Is that right? Can you put your hand up? Are you, did you have a question? Or are you staff? <laughs> OK, no. Um, then over here, lady there. Uh, Hi there. My name's Andy Graham. I'm from <laughs> Tesco Bank. I'm just wondering what role do you think cash will play in 2030 and beyond? Uh, do you want to take that or shall I? Um, I think I the I'll do a very quick one on that so we can get some more in. Cash? I think cash will stay a, uh, play a part and there will be some destinations that will actually um, emphasize their willingness to take cash. But I think in many, many societies, we will have moved to uh, either more and more plastic, more and more digital equivalents of credit cards, but also to smart money where you can give it rules. So for example, I can instruct my cash in the bank to buy the holiday where I get the cheapest price, that it can be looking on my behalf because I've made that money smart. Um, I think there was a lady on the far side. If, do you want to stand up again who had a question? No? OK. Uh, gentleman over there, standing up. Uh, yeah, so my name is Gerben. I'm um, a tourism student. And on behalf of the people who will have the future in tourism, could I ask one of you to give specific shortly something at yeah, some piece of advice basically on what would be most relevant for us to focus on Fahad, uh, you're building the, well the biggest investment in tourism what kind of skills talent requirements do you have to make that experience come to life I think um, it's a it's a difficult one but my advice is if you look at how different sectors are responding to your generation and you see common denominators between gaps between the these sectors and understanding your needs and more your means of transaction with service providers products and with each other as communities because one key um, trend we see in travel you know it moved from nature to culture now we're seeing lifestyle and lifestyle is nothing but a subset of cultural traits that group communities. So you could be a K-pop fan, and you have members within the, your community in Riyadh, in Tokyo. In, so I feel that so many sectors do not recognize how different you transact today and your aspirations. So if I were to advise in short, see the gaps and look at where tourism misses and focus on that. Because those that understand you best will serve you best. And I would like to also give this gentleman a credit. He talked about product development and product in the name, in the frame of experience. I met him, he said, product, 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 when I was in his office. This was last year or so. Now, the biggest function in Saudi Tourism Authority is product. And we have designers in every vertical of lifestyle. Thank you. Well, we've run out of time, but what's been fascinating to me is the role that dance has played in this conversation. So we, I talked about learning new dance routines. Fahd's told us about his interest in electronic dance music and K-pop. The only thing I'd suggest is, given that India's probably going to be the biggest outbound, destiny, outbound source, get learning your Bhangra. Uh, so please, with me, join in thanking the panel for a fascinating a really insightful and far-reaching session. <laughs>